two different neurosurgeons from two different cities said I should have been dead or paralyzed. Look at the x-rays and a neurosurgeon would say this patient is dead or completely paralyzed from the neck down. Two surgeries and God blessed in that process, but I kept, my, my body kept pulling the fusions apart. They didn't hold, they didn't stay. And so on a day that I was supposed to be released from the hospital pending one last x-ray, they already had the cart in my room ready for me to go to leave the hospital loading up things. And they came back and said, sorry, but you need to get back in bed. The last x-ray shows the third surgery has come apart. This surgery will have serious complications and we have to do it and, and, and just get back in. And get, I was in, had a halo brace and lay back down. So I went in just a few moments from the exhilaration of going home to you're facing a third surgery, never been done in the United States, experimental. They'll have to go in through the front, do surgery on the back. I'm not going to tell you all the details, but it was precarious. But God, but God had a plan because within 30 minutes... My pastor and his wife from Baton Rouge, along with brother and sister Tenny, came walking in that hospital room. And brother and sister Tenny was preaching somewhere close. And they said, we've come to, I wouldn't have even been there if I would have been released. But I was there. They came in that room, began to pray. And as they prayed, it was like a ticker tape went across my mind. And the statement said this, and it's become a life principle. You have trusted me in the storm. Now have faith. I'm going to remove the storm. So I received that. And I thank God for it. And 30 minutes later, Pastor Mang, and I, I lived in Baton Rouge at the time, but he called. He said, Greg, my family's passing through Baton Rouge. We want to stop and see you at the hospital. They stopped and visited, and we began to pray again after visiting. And while we prayed, that same statement crossed my mind. You've trusted me in the storm. Now have faith. I'm going to remove the storm. And I told Pastor what I, what I saw, and he, you can't imagine this, I know, but he bounded across that room. He put his finger by my face, and he said, Will you believe that word? God's going to do it. That's how I remember. And then pastor said, the Bible says, if we have childlike faith, all things are possible. Gentry was five years old. He said, Gentry, I want you to lay hands on Greg, and we're going to believe for a miracle. Hey, Amen. Now, I still remember this, and I love this. He said, now, Gentry, we believe God's going to heal him, but don't be pushing his head around. Lay hands on his shoulder. We've got to have wisdom. And Gentry and Mangan family prayed with me. And in just a few days, the surgery was scheduled a few days later. And the evening before the third surgery, my doctor come in with a bewildered look on his face. He said, your, your, your surgery, your, your neck pulled apart two fusion surgeries. I put a halo brace on you on the second one. These things don't happen, but it slipped back into place. And as of right now, I just, I just touched base with two other neurosurgeons. Your surgery is canceled. You can go home tomorrow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's part of my story. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Mm. And then sometime in the 90s, a young lady in her 20s messed up. And things had progressed to where she became a crystal meth addict and lost everything and was living, I believe, with grandparents in Farmerville after a rehab stint. But she heard somebody told her that somebody was on fire for God and she said what him he was part of the group that we did drugs with the night before I went in rehab I got to find out what he's got she drove all the way from Farmerville to Alexandria found somebody that said I've been baptized in Jesus name and filled with the Holy Ghost she was here the next Sunday baptized in Jesus name filled with the Holy Ghost and delivered that's my bride I'm talking about Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And at our wedding that I just talked about, my mother-in-law and father-in-law were here. But he was on one end of the pew and she was on the other. And God showed Sister Vesta and she turned and told somebody, said, I see Jamie's mom and dad back together. And in less than a year, when our Emory was born, they came to that hospital and we noticed they seemed like they're kind of snuggling a little bit in those pictures. <laughs> 17 years. 
God brought them together at the birth of our first daughter. They talked that night and talked the next day, and they've never been apart since. A few months later, I married them. What a miracle. Hallelujah. What a miracle. Hallelujah. And last Sunday, Easter Sunday, we were in church together, standing in the aisle. We spent Christmas and Thanksgiving in their home. And every time I'm with them, I'm looking at a miracle. You may say, Greg, why did you take those minutes to tell those three miracles? Here's why. Because if you come with any idea that God will not involve himself in the affairs of men, if God will not make an impact, call it supernatural, call it a miracle, call it a divine visitation, you've come too late to tell me that my God is not a miracle-working God. Every time I look in the mirror, I'm looking at a miracle. Every time I look at my bride, I'm looking at a miracle. Every time I spend time with my enemies, laws. I'm looking at a miracle. I'm here to tell you our God is able. Our God has all power. Our God is a mighty God. He's a mighty God. After a very busy summer last year, things finally settled down a bit at the end of July and I started a long revival that was only two hour drive away. This revival was only on Sundays and Wednesdays. So I was able to be home several days during the week. We had moved to a new place on Marie Street during the summer, and I'd been getting out and working in the yard. Louisiana summertime, my favorite time to try to get out in the yard is the last hour of daylight, hoping it doesn't work, but hoping it's a few degrees cooler. And I didn't realize it, but those last hours, the hours called dusk, is mosquitoes favorite time to come out big fat hummingbird sized mosquitoes and little did i know at the time that the wrong one got me my body started hurting a little bit but i still had one weekend of the revival to complete so i drove and preached on sunday morning sunday night feeling so bad was offered to spend the night, but knew I need to get home now, and I'm glad I did. I didn't get out of the bed on Monday. I didn't get out of the bed the rest of that week. The first three or four days was just an ache that you couldn't hardly move, and then it turned into nauseousness and sick and and fever, but the first few days was just ache. But on Friday, the situation had greatly progressed, and Jamie came in and found me on the floor beside my bed, fever of 106, mostly out of my mind. And I heard my daughter carried me to the vehicle and took me to the hospital. And at first, they did not have a diagnosis. But they knew that whatever was going on was very, it was very serious. For me, I was kind of there, but not all the way there. It was like I could see people like looking through a tunnel. I could see them at the end. I knew things were going on around me but I was mostly out of my mind. That went on for four or five days. On one of those scary days, mostly out of my mind, somewhere in my heart I was telling God how much I needed him. And God ministered something to me in that moment with four antibiotics flowing through the IV, hoping one of them would work. With an antiviral med flowing through my body, hoping one would work. Something came over me, and I was saying, God, I'm powerless. I'm helpless, and I need you. And God said to me, he spoke to me, and you'll need me just as much on your best day as you need me right now on this one of your worst days. Uh, I will need him every day of my life. Can I tell us in this room, we we need Jesus every day. I laid there in that semi-conscious state. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Let me never forget how much I feel I need you today. And remember that every day of my life. After several days of diagnosis, no diagnosis, my body raging with sickness, Jamie was at her wits end considering transferring me to a maybe a larger city or hospital that would have more experience in infectious diseases. You remember that? And on that night, her and my aunt, Glenda Husbeth, had an old-fashioned prayer meeting. Call it a come-to-Jesus prayer meeting. 
Amen. It may not be everybody in this room, but there's somebody in this room needs to have you an old-fashioned come to Jesus prayer meeting tonight. I need you, Jesus. I can't make it without you. And they, they prayed, and something happened that night that became a recurring event over the next few months. And that is this. They said it was as if Jesus walked in the room. Immediately, his presence came, his peace came, and his assurance came. Anybody ever had Jesus walk in the room like that? Shortly after that prayer meeting, I believe even the next day, I was finally received a diagnosis in that it was West Nile virus. You get it from a mosquito that's bitten a bird that has the virus, and then the mosquito bites you. 80% of people who get West Nile, no symptoms. 19% get really sick, just think it's the fever or flu, but their immune system fights it off. That leaves 1%. And it is in this remaining 1% of people that have West Nile that experience severe illness with neurological damage. And that is the 1% is in there. A percentage of those uh, die as, 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 as deaths occur. I fell in that remaining 1%. The threat of long-term damage and death was very real. But the West Nile acted kind of like a fever when it broke. It broke. They had told my wife, if it breaks one way, it leaves his body. If it breaks the other, more serious damage or death. Thank you, Jesus. It broke to the right. Amen. Amen. And so I went to, after just a couple of days of the West Nile breaking, I was sent to a rehab hospital. I was there for two weeks, and we were so excited. I was preparing to come to church for my first service on Sunday. But on Saturday, I started having to ask my family, help me. I, I was able to get up and down on my own. I was still weak, but I could move real slow. But I started having to say, would you help me off the couch? And I, I got dressed on Sunday, came to church in a wheelchair, and I tried to stand. I was so excited to be here. I sat right over there. I tried to stand three times and couldn't get up. A weird pain was coming into my legs. And by, by Wednesday, I was bedridden. My body almost fully paralyzed my, my limbs refusing to cooperate my wife taking all she could to get me from the bed to the chair and 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 on friday uh, back to the hospital i mentioned the paralysis nerve pain in my legs blurry and double vision whatever was happening whatever was happening was happening fast and was truly scary because this time i was more alert to know what was going on but God was about to show himself. Oh, he was about to show himself in a very real way. Amen. We went to the ER and Brother Roger took me to the ER and Jamie's family was in town. They had a lot of stuff to do that day and she came two or three times to the ER, but it was a long day. Brother Roger said, I'll sit with you, Greg. And, and, and the first doctor came in and he said, oh, I'm going to have to send you home. This is just the results of West Nile. You've been hit very hard. And the West Nile, he said, we can't help you. I would like to tell you at this moment that my wife got anointed right then, and I don't believe it was the Spirit of God. She let that doctor know something else is going on. He's been home for two weeks. And another doctor got involved and said, I'll do all I can to try to help. I don't see how we can help you, but we'll try to figure it out. And he left, and we didn't know if I was being admitted or not to run further tests. And a lady walked in. My nurse was in the room doing something, but a lady walked in and just stood quietly. She had a packet in her hands. And finally, when the nurse backed off, she came and laid the packet on my, on my chest, and she said, you've been admitted. And Brother Roger and I said, yeah, thank you, Jesus. We're going to get some further testing done. And, and, and I noticed when the lady went to leave, she paused at the door, and she kind of looked back, and then she left. 20 minutes later, am I telling the truth, Brother Roger? 20 minutes later, her head stuck back in the door. I'd never seen this lady before. She had never seen me in her life. She worked at the hospital. She opened the door, she looked, and she said, now that your nurse is not here, I can tell you what I'm supposed to tell you. And she walked through that room right beside my bed. She sat down on a little stool, and she looked. I, I, she had all my attention, I promise you. And she said, the reason you're going through what you're going through the reason that you're going through what you're going through is because of your calling and your anointing. Can I tell somebody in that instant, I knew. 
Ha, somebody's got to hear me right now. In that instant, I knew, hell, you ain't in charge. <laughs> Devil, you ain't in control of what's going on in this room right now. Hallelujah. You're not, you're not in control of what's going on in this room right now. Amen. My God might not have did this to me, but he's going to use it for his glory. My God might not have did this, but at the least, it had his permission when it got to me. I live inside of the strong tower. If it got to me, then my God knew about it, and he let it happen, and he's going to use it for his glory. I got to tell somebody right now, Jesus Christ, Hebrews 12, 2, is the author. We're supposed to look to Jesus. He is the author and... Somebody tell me he's the what? Author and finisher. I know I'm supposed to be testifying, but allow me to preach for just a minute. All the devil is is a reporter, and I don't mean to demean a reporter, but all a reporter can do is report what they see or what they research. In other words, it can be present tense or past tense, but if a reporter writes about the future, all that is is speculation, but not an author. When an author writes a story... <laughs> When that author develops a character, he's got the end in mind. An author can handle the future. Devil, you're just my reporter. But Jesus! He's my author. He has for you a hope and a future. Hmm. Her next words. For the next little while, you must not look through your natural eyes only. You're going to have to look through the eyes of the spirit and through the eyes of faith. She said, whatever all goes on, no, it's temporary. No, you're going to come through this. Huge tears running down my face. Uh, you can ask Brother Roger. I said, are you an angel? She said, no, but I got a word for you. She said, one day when you're preaching again. One day when you're preaching again and walking back and forth across that platform. <laughs> I guess it wasn't hard for God to tell her all the other stuff. It wasn't hard to tell her I was a preacher and that I don't like to stand still. I got to be careful tonight. Amen. But she said, when, when you're preaching and walking back across that platform, you tell them that you have a mighty God. You tell them everything that God's done for you. So I think it's good time for me to take a little walk right now. I got to tell somebody in this house, you serve a mighty God. I got to tell somebody in this house, he's a deliverer. I got to tell somebody... I got to tell you, he's a powerful God. I got to tell you, my God is able to deliver. He is able to save. He is able. I'm walking, Pastor. He's able to restore. Mm. Mm. He'll either walk with you in your storm or he'll step to the bow of the boat and calm your storm. Either way, he's your Jesus, and he is with you. Mm. And then she got a little preachy on me for her last line. I think she even pointed a little bit. She said, you hear me, your story is for his glory. She said, you hear me, your story is for his glory. I said, honey, that'll preach right now. And you just gave me my title when I share what God has done for me. So you saw it on the screen. My story is for his glory. It's all about him. But he let, he let it happen to me, so I get to tell about him. And what, am I awesome, what an awesome moment of prophecy in that emergency room however don't mean to discourage anybody but it got worse before it got better starting over the next few days after that prophecy they did another spinal tap let me just tell you husbands if you ever have to get a spinal tap don't expect mercy from your wife who's had an epidural That scared me for a whole day. And I'm like, Jamie, that gun's down there. Baby ladies do it every day. Get over it. <laughs> but they were able to make another diagnosis. Am I telling the truth? Are you all right? They were able to make another diagnosis. And this time it happened on a Sunday. My doctor, neurologist, came in and he said, you, you have something called Guillain-Barre syndrome. I'd never heard of Guillain-Barre but it is when your body's immune system attacks your own nervous system 
and begins to attack the part of the nerves that send, send messages to your arms, your legs, and eventually other organs. And the brain can't send those messages, and so you become weakened, paralyzed as that unfolds, which is what had happened in my life. That was heavy. The treatment for, for GBS was called IVIG. Papa, thanks for researching it so much and telling me so much about it. IVIG. Papa worked for Baxter Pharmaceuticals for years and did a lot of research. But IVIG, to make one bag of IVIG, and I had four doses and found out it's $10,300 a bag. I will confess. I wanted to figure out how to get that stuff back out and sell it. <laughs> but IVIG is made from hundreds. Some websites that I looked at said even over 1,000 healthy blood donors. Listen at this. It's amazing. Blood donors, over a thousand blood donors donate their blood and in the lab their blood is processed down to the plasma and then to the, what's called the immunoglobulins or the antibodies in lay terms. The part of blood that is related to immunity is taken out of hundreds of people's blood and put in one bag of this medicine called IVIG that then is put through IV into your body and, and helps right your immune system and helps to, to help helps you to fight infection. So that was going to start on Monday night at 10, my IVIG. But on Sunday afternoon, God said, mm, I think I'm going to start my IVIG just a little bit sooner. Listen, my Jamie wanted to come to church. So Davin Ainsworth, a powerful man of God in this church, came and sat with me. And we were watching service on my laptop that night. And it was one of those nights that God and Pastor Gentry were pretty fired up. And by the second song, everybody was at this altar praying. And so after about 10 minutes of praying, I said, turn it down. We'll just visit a while because it was, it was praying and, and music in the background. After about 10 minutes of us sitting there with the music, with it down a little bit, all of a sudden, Pastor, you grabbed the microphone. And you were somewhere about right here. But you said, church, we need to pray right now for Greg Albritton. Hey, man, I looked at Davin. I said, turn that up. That's me he's talking about. Turn it up right now. <laughs> he turned it up. And pastor said, Greg has received a new diagnosis today. And we got to pray for Greg right now. I want somebody to hear this. I want somebody to understand this right now. It didn't take three minutes and it didn't take five minutes. My hands could move laterally a little bit. I stuck my hand through the rail and Davin held my hand. And the power of God exploded in that room. God is not hindered by hospital walls. God is not hindered by distance from this location. Thank you, Pastor. And you prayed for us on that Sunday night. And it was as if God said, they about to start your IVIG with hundreds of people's blood pouring into your body. Amen. Uh -huh. I got hundreds of people right now that's about to call on the name of Jesus. About to cry out to the power of Almighty God. Mm. Call it God's IVIG. We prayed so long, Pastor felt to drop by. He dropped in for a moment. He walked in. He said, I came to take authority and dominion, but it's already here. God's already here. Let's pray. And we took off to praying. Pastor stayed for a moment, turned to leave, and then walked my wife, my sister, and praying people from this church. We just turned around. He turned around, kept on praying some more. God said, it's my IVIG. On Tuesday, on Monday, the IVIG started. On Tuesday. God's continued because friends had, before my second diagnosis, organized a day of prayer and fasting for Greg Albright. Very key day. Many of you joined in that. Hallelujah. And it was again as if God said, you're, you're getting these doses Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. I got it covered from my side. <laughs> Amen. I got people pouring into you. They understand the gift comes from God, but he uses impartation. He uses the prayers of faith. He uses the prayers of faith. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I felt a few weeks ago after pastor asked me to speak something I've only told my wife and maybe one dear friend. But on that night when God ministered in that room so strong, I received 
I've never received a message from the Lord this quietly, if that makes sense. It just like came into my mind, and it was there, and I couldn't make it go away, but I didn't understand it. And in case I missed it, I didn't want to tell Jamie, and you'll understand, but the statement said, hold on for 14 days. Everything's going to be all right. I'm like, Lord, I felt your healing power. I felt your strength in this room. What do you mean hold on for 14 days? But later I came to understand it was a powerful word from God. I didn't tell Jamie because what if I got better in two days? I didn't want her wordy in the next 12. Or what if I didn't get better for two, four weeks? I didn't want her. So, so I just kept it to myself. Woke up the next morning to the symptoms, worsening, nausea, dizzy, sensitive to any motion, any noise, any light. And that whole day, minutes seemed like hours. And I'd say, today's 14. After today, I only got 13 of them left. But my God said, if I hold on for 14 days, everything is going to be all right. That was on Monday. Tuesday is the day of my second dose and the day of prayer and fasting. And I will tell you, something shifted in my body. They say with that medicine that it takes four days to a few weeks to make, to make the difference, not mine. The nausea is left on Tuesday. The sensitivity of my eyes and ears left on Tuesday. And, and my body changed. The pain left. I was still weak, but the pain left my body. And I give God praise and glory. I thank God for IVIG, but I thank him for his IVIG that worked in my life. So they sent me back to rehab hospital for inpatient therapy. And so I'm in, I got, well, let me just tell one more thing real fast. The, the day before I went back to the rehab therapy, Brother Bustard came by my room very briefly. And he visited for a moment and he said, he said, it's time to pray. But instead of moving to my head and laying hands on my head, Brother Bustard said today, the spirit, he said, I always pray that God will heal someone from head to toe. And he said, and I lay hands on their head. But today, the Spirit has instructed me to pray for you for healing from toe to head. And he went and laid hands upon my feet. And he prayed that God would heal me from toe to head. I asked him, Brother Bustard, do you know why you prayed that way? No, I just obeyed the Lord. I told him. I was able to tell him. Guillain-Barre, and I quote from Mayo Clinic website. Guillain-Barre syndrome often begins with tingling and weakness starting in your feet and legs and spreads to your upper body and arms and that's exactly how it happened in my life. It started low and it worked up. The paralysis worked up. Amen. I gotta tell somebody tonight. Amen. Can you can you comprehend we have a God, amen, that knows all, sees all. Don't let the devil tell you God don't know where you're at. Amen. A man who's prayed hundreds of times, God healed them from head to toe, laid hands on my feet because God said that's the disease in his body. So I was back to rehab, counting down my days, but things were going so good I thought I might have missed it. When my side started hurting, about day seven, if I'm counting backwards, 14 down, I counted back. It was a countdown for me. But on day seven, oh, I got seven days left. Hurts so bad. They thought it was medicines messing with my stomach or all kind of stuff. And for two days, I remember crying like a baby in front of my daughter, telling my wife I hurt too bad to pray. She had to pray. The next day, coughed up some blood and sent me back to the ER, to the hospital, trusting God. But can I tell you, it hit us heavy. Jamie lost a cousin in her 20s two weeks after childbirth of her second child because a blood clot broke off and went to her heart and took her life. So when they told me, you have a blood clot, a large blood clot in your right lung, you have three small ones in your left lung, you have one in your left leg, I'm not going to lie to you, even though I had words from God, it hit hard. When... When you tell your wife, I believe God's going to carry me through, and I spoke faith, and you can ask her, I believe God's going to carry me through, but if you don't, and you give her your own funeral plans, it's pretty heavy. When you talk children and life insurance, all that stuff is pretty heavy. 
Thank you. Don't get me wrong. Still believed that our God was with us. And I promise you, without telling our soul, I was saying six. I got six of them left. If I can make it six more days, everything is going to be all right. My, uh, I want to move along for time, but I got to give you one more scripture. Luke 8, 22 through 25. 11 words, verse 22, Jesus said, 11 word statement, let us go over to the other side of the lake. Doesn't us mean Jesus and you and you and Jesus together? Next verse, Bible says, he fell asleep and there came a storm. Anybody ever find that happens that when Jesus kind of backs off, a storm hits real quick? Lord, the minute you get quiet, all hell breaks loose. He went to sleep. The storm hit. And they were experienced on the water, knew that lake very well. But the Bible says their boat, they were filled with water, and they were in jeopardy. It wasn't Hollywood graphics water. It was real water. And it was real jeopardy to experienced fishermen. Amen. What happened to Jamie and I was real. The concern was real. The, 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 the wondering what's going on was real. I got to tell somebody, I'm not one that's going to lie and say it's not water in the boat when there's water in the boat. I'm not going to say I'm not in jeopardy when I'm in jeopardy. But I got to tell you, even though he was sleeping, you've got Jesus in the boat and jeopardy in the boat. Which one are you going to put your greatest faith in? You've got a word and you got some water. Which one? Jesus said, where is your faith? I believe Jesus was saying, you could look at me and look at the water. Which one are you going to trust to have the most power? Sometimes you got to admit the circumstances are real, but keep holding on and keep believing and trusting in God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My lung doctor was a very soft-spoken man. I had no idea that he was a Christian and full of faith. But he sat down uh, by the second day of, of this visit, a uh, hospital stay, and he said, I have a word of encouragement for you. He said, all of this seems crazy to you. He said, however, what has happened to you, these three different issues, isn't as abnormal as you think. He said, the West Nile broke your body down. He said, Guillain-Barre is a secondary sickness that usually follows something else that breaks your body down. And then you were bedridden for 10 days, and that, that made you susceptible to the blood clots. And he pointed at me. God used a medical doctor in this town to look at me and give me a word. And he said, I speak encouragement to you. All that's over, and you're about to be getting well. Everything's going to be all right. And then he looked at me. He said, Reverend, would you mind praying for me? You think I had any problem praying at that moment? God's presence came in that room. He said, we're going to keep an observation until next Friday. That's eight more days. I only got two days left in this 14-day deal. <laughs> and on Sunday, if you're counting down, it was day one. In other words, it's the end. On Sunday, my general doctor walked in the room and he said, I don't know what your lung doctor is going to say. He said, but if it was up to me, I'd release you to rehab tomorrow. You have recovered so fast from this blood clot. You're ready for therapy. My lung doctor can't mm -hmm. give God a hand clap of praise. My lung doctor came in on Monday. He said, you're doing so good. I'm releasing you back to therapy. It took one day for paperwork and the process to get me transferred. But after 14 days, I haven't had one setback. I haven't had one other thing. It's all been strength recovery and therapy since that day. Amen. But I haven't had one setback since day 14 when my Jesus told me, you hold on for 14 days and everything is going to be all right. God major touched my body again. Another shift on communion Sunday. What a powerful service that was the Sunday before BOTT. But from that moment in that hospital room, not one more setback. Not one more challenge. Except being worked half to death by these wonderful therapists. I was asking God a few weeks ago, God, to be honest, that's a little strange. This 14-day deal. It was a word. Tim, thank you for your powerful message a few weeks ago. It was a word from God, Tim, for me to hold on to 
like, let us go over to the other side. Jesus is in the boat. It's not going down. He said, hold on. But I was asking God, and it was after pastor had asked me sometime soon to minister. And I was asking God, God, that 14-day deal, it was just kind of kind of strange. I didn't even tell anybody. Parts that I, I, I didn't even know for sure until it all unfolded. It was, it was just so real, though. I, I counted down every day. And the Lord spoke to me as clear as he's ever spoke to me. And he said, you stand in that pulpit and you tell somebody their trial has an expiration date on it. He said, you stand in that pulpit and you tell somebody, keep holding on and keep having faith because your trial has an expiration date on it. You got to keep, you got to keep trusting. You got to keep having faith. You got to keep believing. Amen. I'm talking to somebody that's been going through it. I'm talking to somebody with a calling and with anointing on your life and you don't know why everything has happened the way it's happened. I'm telling you, keep believing. Keep holding on in faith. Keep trusting and believe in God. God is going to step in on your behalf. God is going to make a way where there seems to be no way. It may, it may not be everybody, but if it's you, would you lift your hands to the Lord? I need that word, Brother Greg. My trial has an expiration date on it. I'm going to stay faithful. I'm going to stay faithful. I'm going to trust in my God. I'm going to believe that my God. Come on, somebody. Lift your hands to the Lord right now. My God is able. Your storm has a shelf life on it. It's only going to last so long. You keep holding on. You keep believing. You keep, you keep trusting and calling on the name of Jesus. Would you all stand with me across this room? If you feel to, take the hand of a friend or family member, loved one beside you. Just lift it to the heavens. Just pray over them. That person beside you may be in a storm. Amen. You just tell them your trial has an expiration date. Your storm has a shelf life. You keep trusting your Jesus. It may seem like he's taking a nap, but he's still in your boat. And your boat's not going under with Jesus on it. Your boat's not going under with Jesus on it. Your boat's not going under with Jesus on it. Somebody received that as a word from the Lord. He didn't give me names or faces, but he told me to tell you. He told me to tell you. He told me to tell you. In the name of Jesus. 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 Pastor, will you come stand by me a moment? I promise God. I was a recipient on the other side of that camera in a hospital room. When you said, we're going to pray for Greg right now. And I don't know who all may be watching tonight, but I made God a promise. Every time I know a church is being broadcast. Somewhere in that service, I'm going to speak a word to those that may be sitting in their room needing a renewing in the spirit. Somebody that may be sitting in their room needing a touch, a nursing home or a hospital. Church, God's IVIG is about to work right now. Would you point your hands to the middle aisle? Amen. There's a camera in the back. In the name of Jesus Christ, wherever you are in your home, are you in your room or are you in your sick bed? I speak faith to you right now. Slip your hands to the Lord. If you're by someone, you can take their hand. Lift it to the Lord. Jesus, pour out your Holy Spirit right now. Jesus, pour out healing right now. Jesus, pour out anointing right now. We speak faith. We speak the healing, the strengthening, delivering, restoring power of Almighty God. I said, lift your hands to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Church, that's God's IVI. I got a text this afternoon. Jim Edwards, a faithful man in this church, been down in his back for several weeks, said, Greg, I wanted to come, but I can't be out of bed for more than two minutes. That's bad back situation going on right now. Jim, we're activating God's IVIG. You're my friend. I speak the power of the Holy Ghost to your room right now. I speak the same Holy Ghost that came to my room to come to your room and touch your spirit and touch your body right now in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. 
Jesus' name. I close. But it's not just my story. That's for his glory. I feel like the lady that stepped in my room. Because I got to stand on this pulpit. And look people in the face across this room. And tell you like she told me. You hear me now. Your story is for his glory. Your story is for his glory. Somebody say it. My story. Somebody make it personal. My story is for his glory glory. One more time. We're about to come to the front. One more time. We just let faith be released in this room. Take that hand one more time. Lift that hand to the Lord one more time. Let Jesus use you right in your pew. Let Jesus, I see people, amen, crying, weeping in the presence of the Lord. I see people crying out for a touch from heaven right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, don't be afraid to act in faith right now. Don't be afraid to act in faith right now. He's in this house right now. His presence is in the, there's deliverance. There's anointing oil. There's power from the throne room. Power from the throne room. Power from the throne room. I'm sorry, I can't pass this moment before we move. Just turn again and turn and lay hands on their head or on their shoulder. If they're a guest, ask them if you can take their hand. Pray for somebody near you. There's oil flowing in this room right now. Derek, Derek Parker, would you come see me? There's virtue in this room right now. There's virtue in this room right now. Uh, that's it. Somebody just let healing oil flow. Somebody let the healing oil flow. That's it. Sister Tenny, I just feel it in her spirit. Somebody lay hands on Sister Tenny right now. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, ministry team, would you come to the front real quick? Brother Robin, come on, any, any minister praying, I just want you to come. If you need a miracle in your life, you need a touch from heaven in your life, we've prayed the body one for another, I-V-I-G, but you need something that only comes from heaven. You need something that doesn't come from earth. I want you to just step out and come. As real as Jesus walked these aisles in a drama last week, he's walking these aisles in spirit right now. Amen. Come. Would you come? It doesn't matter to me the need. God can restore marriages right now. God can minister in your family right now. God can minister in your body right now. God can minister deliverance, hope, strength. That's it. In the pews, keep praying. But there may be some that wants to step out. There may be some that wants to come to this front. A couple people gather around Sister Tinny. Amen. Let's pray strength to our Sister Tinny right now. Pray virtue from the throne room right now. In Jesus' name. You need a renewing in your spirit, whether in your pew or in these aisles. Lift your hands to the heavens. You need something from God. near you. That's it. If you didn't come to the front, just keep praying in your pew. In the name of Jesus, God, touch our friends in this house. Hallelujah. God, touch our friends in this house. We speak healing oil. We speak virtue from the throne. Jesus, you came to my hospital room. Come to somebody's room right now. Come to somebody's spirit right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, that's it. You're praying in your pews. You don't have to leave just yet. You don't have to leave just yet. <laughs> Would you slip your hands with me to the Lord all across this room another time? Father, in every section. Father, in every family.
Father, in every home unit represented in this house. Father, in every one of my friends that I've been praying with, God, bless my friends. Bless my friends in Grace House, Lord. Let a virtue flow. Let an anointing flow. Father, in the name of Jesus, we speak faith over Mary Duran right now. Hallelujah. Mary, you're watching online. I pray the anointing of the Holy Ghost come to you right now. Mary Duran, we pray the anointing of the Holy Ghost come to you right now. That our Jesus will touch your body. That our Jesus will touch you and Brother Dennis' spirit right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Go to anybody's room. We don't have everybody's name. That's it. You be filled with the Holy Ghost right now. You receive renewing in the spirit right now. You can receive hope for your family right now. You can receive hope for your family right now. Your trial has an expiration date. Keep holding on. Keep believing in faith. He's going to step in that room just like he did mine. Keep holding on. God, from the front row to the back, let oil come right now. Let healing oil, the strength from the throne room come right now. I know what faith 